So let's play around a little bit more with our cube and, uh, and, and the different intersections that we have uh, in the cube in our framework to see, to see how we can work with it. So on the policy and strategy sides, on the one that guides the application of technology in society, uh, I said you can distinguish basically two kinds of different intervention. That is positive feedback and negative feedback. So I've been trained, my, my main field of, of, of general interdisciplinary study is, is complex adapt adaptive systems. System. So in, in, in complex systems science, what you do is you try to intervene into a dynamic uh, ecosystem, basically, and try to influence it. So you, you work with feedback, with existing feedback loops, and you change them. And these are the kind of two systems choices that you have, positive or negative. Now, it's not really related to positive or negative. It has more to do positive means you foster an existing tendency or some kind of tendency. That means you can blow it up or you can extinguish it. You drive it to the extreme. That's what positive feedback means. So you drive it to an extreme. You either put oil into the fire or you put water into the fire. You blow it up or you put it out. Negative feedback means you try to hold it in a certain range. You can also use oil and fire in order to do that. That's just, that's just the mechanism. But the goal is to keep the fire burning at kind of like this. And you don't want it to blow up and get out of control. And you don't want it to go out. So that's negative feedback. You kind of like hit it from the top and, and, and from below and have it in the desired range. That's just how you use these two terms in cybernetics, which is control theory, which is part of a complex adaptive system science. So these are the two interventions we have. Now let's look at some intersections that we have around the cube. For example, we could start with infrastructure. And we don't care about the, the application now. Could be business, could be government. We look at positive feedback in order to foster new infrastructure or get away with some infrastructure. So if you want to create something new, some new technology, many people look at the life after Google. It's difficult to imagine, but one thing that we know from inf innovation theory for sure is that we and our technologies is not the creme de la creme, the last result of human evolution. Something will come after Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, and so forth. And what is the life after Google? There's actually uh, a book by, uh, uh, by Gilder, who is a big uh, visionary who makes a lot of predictions about technological development. And he says, well, the life after Google is the fall of big data the fall of this data science, and the rise of the blockchain economy. And many people put a lot of hope on this new kind of infrastructure, which is called the blockchain. So there's this running gag if you go to one of these tech conferences that I, I hang out uh, at a lot, uh, somebody, somebody will promote the blockchain. And the blockchain, blockchain, block, you can like wait for it. It's a running gag among, among, uh, in the audience. And somebody will go up on stage and, and oversell the, the miraculous benefits of the blockchain that will change all, that will solve all of our problems. Now, a new technology is always indistinguishable from magic to some degree because per definition it's new uh, and we have to but we have to also be careful not to, to oversell the blockchain 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 that <laughs> comes up so much in, in in these conferences so what is it the magical blockchain this magical piece of new infrastructure well the definition of the blockchain and just uh, make keep it simple is it's a list of records which are blocks uh, in a growing list of records, so you grow that over time, that are cryptographically linked, so that makes the blocks chain, so it's records, blocks that are linked cryptographically um, with a timestamp and transaction data. And that's all it is. So that's, that's what the block chain is. It's a linked of cryptographically linked records. Now, you can implement it in different ways, having a distributed ledger, for example, that everybody knows what every block is actually about. And you can go about it. You can encrypt it. You can say like, some people can see some of them. So the famous cryptocurrencies is one application of this infrastructure. So there's some generic services. And so that doesn't change the infrastructure. It's just the blockchain, right? The cryptocurrencies, bitcoins, and so forth, is just one application to the sector of finance. You can use the blockchain as well for governmental purposes. For example, your vaccination record could be on the blockchain. 
and next time you want to enter a country and see if you're allowed instead of carrying around a little yellow or white paper or whatever that shows if you do or do not have a vaccine it could be on the blockchain secured cryptographically linked and then once you get to the frontier they know if you have this kind of immunization if it's valid or not so it would be on the blockchain government in general where we have a lot some countries are suffering from a lot of corruption and that is not only poor countries it's the richest countries on planet earth that's suffering a lot from corruption so bringing a lot of government processes on the blockchain since it's supposedly the public sector and being able to verify that doesn't mean it has to be public in a sense that it's transparent it can be encrypted same as cryptocurrency is encrypted you might not know how much money I have in cryptocurrency you cannot see that but everybody can verify how much money uh, that that nobody's stealing money from somebody so there are different ways to implement it but that's basically so that's the idea of having a growing list of records blocks which are cryptographically linked a chain and they usually have a timestamp and the transaction data so you know who transacted with what and that's it now your imagination can run wild with it uh, on where to apply it and many people say like that's the next big thing so we want to foster this new technology for example maybe and who knows I, I don't know these predictions are often very much off and I've been in this for, for too many for too many years to, uh, to, to to put my my money on some kind of bets but the blockchain certainly has a lot of very interesting applications now we can also have negative feedback and try to control it that means we don't want to do away with Google and have the next big thing that we really want to foster. So put out this fire and light up a new fire. We can just also regulate kind of like the fire that we have, the social media reality that we live in. And the social media reality has some negative effects. We talked a lot about them in, in previous segments. One is the surveillance state that we haven't talked about uh, 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 much yet. Uh, surveillance, surveillance capitalism, it's often called. And that's kind of like that we all together given the digital footprint that we leave behind inevitably with every digital step we take, um, we kind of like live in a glass house. I don't know if you remember these reality shows, uh, these nascent reality shows, where you basically could see in a glass house how people actually behave all day long. And we kind of like live in this panoptic uh, opticum uh, that with our digital trackers that we have, uh, we're getting monitored, our feelings, even our emotions, our personalities, our behavioral swings get monitored, not only where we move in our location, but also our physical and mental well-being gets monitored so we basically we, we basically live in this kind of panopticum in this surveillance capitalism so this data then gets converted into uh, in the capital machinery especially through the attention economy gets converted into money so and, and, and some some states uh, have have uh, have cashed in on that too Edward Snowden here in the United States of America has revealed how much after 9-11 some laws were passed that gave very big powers to the famous three-letter agencies NSA and so forth CIA FBI to to collect data and Edward Snowden as the whistleblower has revealed a lot of what's been going on in the years after 9-11 and that was many years after 9-11 it took many years for him to reveal that right what actually was going on there and kind of like the glass house that the, the, the uh, that the normal person is already living in in the United States and how it's monitors across the globe it was motivated for fighting terrorism so that was the Patriot Act was passed that enabled much of that was going on but not only in the United States some other big countries you talk about the United States you can also talk about China the other world power economic power in China you have the social credit score so basically, when you act, you get monitored. And if you do good things like donating blood or engage in charity or helping the poor, you get positive points. And if you do undesired behavior, for example, you're spreading fake news or you're cheating in a, playing an online game or you neglect your old parents and don't visit an old relative regularly, you can get negative points. That's reported in the social credit system. So that's literally the game of life 
right? And, and then you, you can, some doors can close because you have too negative of a score, right? So you can be penal, penal, penalized for that. And with the panopticum, with this all-seeing surveillance capitalism around us, uh, that's getting, getting quite, uh, well, quite questionable. How much you want to nudge people and who decides what is actually fake news and what is not actually fake news. So you have that across the globe in all kind of uh, shapes and form, the surveillance state. Now the question is, so it's been faced on us, the citizen. So somebody, the capital, capitalist companies surveil us in order to make money. The state surveils us in order to provide security or economic growth, whatever the motivation is. But uh, the cameras are on us, right? So the, for a long time, the question has been, can we also turn the cameras around, especially in a democracy where a public servant is supposed to serve us? So could we just monitor the public servant? So we put kind of like, Obama, Trump, and all the leaders, right, into, into this glass house. And if you want to be a public servant, like if you really want to do that, like we, we kind of like can observe you just like a participant in a reality show 24-7 and see what's happening with you all the time um, and, and also understand your dis Because as a democratic representative, you are supposed to represent me. So... If you want to play that game, let's represent me. Now, this technology doesn't exist for now, right? So this technology is not like these, these public officials. They are in letters supposed to represent the public uh, and be public and transparent. But in reality, it's not like they have sensors that tracks them all the time. They're actually, we can see how they reason because they're supposed to, according to medicine, uh, one of the founding fathers who wrote uh, the Federalist Papers, what this Constitution is based on in the United States, right? They should be, should reason in our name. So why not allow me to see how they actually reason, who they talk to, who they get influenced by, what are they doing? Put them in a glass house, right? So this argument has been around for a long time. Actually, um, the thesis of my first doctoral, uh, my first doctoral studies, uh, I wrote on e-democracy, and that was many years back. So that's been many years. These ideas have been around uh, for many years already. Uh, Yuval Harari, Yuval Harari, a philosopher historian, also brought up this idea again more recently. So these ideas have been around for a long time, but we still have not done it. Like this infrastructure of regulating who monitors who is not, doesn't exist yet. And it has to do with an infrastructure change, also with a cultural change, in order to, to, to implement that. 